you all for uh, coming out so early. I appreciate uh, you spending some time with me. Uh, I, I bet that a lot of you have come strictly because we're talking about Settlers of Catan. How, how, many, how many people are, are fans of Settlers? Got it. Awesome. Amazing. So I bet you were wondering why were we studying math papers? as the pre-roll to, uh, to this topic. Um, well, if you, um, if you uh, were, were paying attention to the, uh, to the title, you might uh, have seen a clue there. So uh, how many of my uh, folks are gamers here? All right, we got, we got tons of gamers. So either you've, you've played Monopoly, maybe uh, uh, B, I hate fun. Or, uh, or is it C, I'm a level 12 dungeon master. <laughs> or of course, it's D, dungeon masters don't have levels. Um, but now, where are my mathematicians? Let me see. Is it A, I passed algebra? We got a few folks. Uh, B, I'm a cadet. Can't add, don't even try. Uh, I compute eigenvectors in my sleep. That's, yeah, that's, that's the kind of person I'm looking forward to talking to this morning. Or, I actually know what your session title means. So the, uh, the second half, awesome, we got uh, a few that... Uh, um, that picked up on that. The second half of the title, um, you know, Modeling Settlers of Catan with Degrees of Freedom. That was the, uh, um, the key bit there, but uh, if, if, you, if you pay attention to the abstract, it actually says you probably aren't writing games. But yet, uh, here we are in the mobile and games track, based, I'm sure, on the title. But I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun uh, nonetheless. What we're going to do is we're going to study a mathematical concept called degrees of freedom and see how we can apply that to software. And the way that we're going to do that is by applying it using games um, because it's early in the morning and uh, it's, it's just fun. So, um, so I tricked you all into coming in here for a math talk. Let's go ahead and get right into the math. Uh, let's suppose that we've got a system where we've got a bead on a wire. And so the bead can move uh, backwards and forward along the wire. Um, just based on, uh, even if you don't know what degrees of freedom is, we'll get into the definition, just based on that idea, uh, what you might think degrees of freedom is, how many degrees of freedom does this system have? I see some ones. Any other guesses? We've got two. Why, why would it be two? And it can spin, yes. Yeah, it's got the, yeah, so you can, you can tell where it is uh, along, the, along the line. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and, and uh, ignore the spin for right now, and we're just talking about the position, then we're talking about something that has just one degree of freedom. So, now let's take that wire and let's bend it and twist it into all sorts of different shapes, and now we've got this child's toy, lots of different beads on these wires. They're moving all through three dimensions. How many degrees of freedom do we have on one of these beads? I see a one, I see a three. The correct answer is one. Even though it's twisting through three dimensions, we only have one degree of freedom. Only one thing can change. It only takes one number to describe where it is. And so that's what I want you to start thinking about when you're thinking about your software systems. How many things can change? How many things really can change? Uh, and uh, I think you'll be surprised at how few things can actually change. So um, if we were to, uh, to, to move this bead along the wire in order to express where it is, what we would really want to do is give just one number. Just where is that position? We don't really need to know the x and y coordinates of it. Or if we do, we can compute those from that one number. So let me give you a, uh, a real quick example. Let's suppose that this were the wire that we're talking about, you know, this uh, top of the truncated cylinder. And uh, so, uh, so this equation, who is it? I don't know. Uh, so this, this equation can be uh, expressed from the top as a circle, and from the side as a line. And then we've seen here we can unroll it and we get this wave. So we'll see how these different shapes kind of play into things. So if we were to look at it from the top, we would say, OK, x squared plus y squared equals 1. We've got a circle. And then we look at it from the side. Now we're talking about not x and y, but we're talking about y and z, and we could say, or x and z, and we could say x equals z, and that gives us the equation of that line. So now we've, we've expressed the entire loop in these two equations. Every point on that loop, every point on that wire, solves these, uh, satisfies these two equations. Um, 
But where does this, where does this, uh, this wave fit in? Um, that, that gets into how, um, how we might want to transform the problem. So um, now we can get to the actual formal definition of degrees of freedom. And uh, so we can compute the degrees of freedom by taking the number of unknowns and subtracting the number of equations. So in the system that we just looked at, we had three unknowns, x, y, and z, and we had two equations. So the number of degrees of freedom is 1. Three unknowns minus two equations, 3 minus 2, 1. Uh, and so now we can take that system, and we can start to rewrite it, because um, it's not just enough that we know that every point along that path satisfies these two equations. We want to uniquely identify a point. And we want to do that in as simply as possible. And so what I'm going to do is introduce an idea, uh, a new variable called t. And uh, now, uh, I know that if I say that x equals sine t, things are going to get better. Things are going to work out. Um, mathematics is a very creative endeavor. And this is the point at which you use your creativity. You say, OK, there's no rule that tells me that I have to choose x equals sine t. But I just know from my past experience and from my creativity that that's going to work out. So that's what's happening here. Um, and now we have introduced a new, um, a new variable, t, and a new equation, x equals sine t. So now we take our number of unknowns. We've got four equations. We have three. We still have one degree of freedom. So we haven't changed the system. Uh, we've just introduced a new concept into it. Uh, but now, what I want to do is introduce another equation, y equals cosine t. And I can find that every y, t, x uh, that solves the original set of equations will also satisfy y equals cosine t. Uh, I, can, I can prove that that's true. So I've introduced a new equation, but doesn't that mean I've taken away a degree of uh, freedom? Hmm. Actually, no, it doesn't, because this new equation isn't a new constraint. It's something that I could already have derived from the existing system. I could simply derive that from the original equation, x squared plus y squared equals 1, so it doesn't give me any more information. It doesn't constrain the system any further. So that means that first equation now is redundant. I can take that away. And now I can continue. I see, well, x equals z, so therefore I know that z is equal to sine t, just like x is. And so I can introduce that equation, take away x equals t, and now I've got back down to um, you know, four unknowns, three equations, one degree of freedom. But now look what else I've done here. In these equations now, x, y, and z are all on the left side. There's only one thing on the right side, and that's t. And so I have expressed x, y, and z in terms of t. And so now we can call t the independent variable and x, y, and z are the dependent variables. So, OK, this is, this is starting to get you know, kind of deep into the math. But here is now another really important point about degrees of freedom. So we have the number of unknowns minus the number of equations. That's one way to compute degrees of freedom. Can you see another way to compute degrees of freedom? It's so the number of independent variables. Perfect. So if you can rewrite your system in order to have just a few independent variables and then compute everything else, now you can uh, tell specifically where you are in your system. You can point to, aha, there's a value of t. I can compute the rest. Uh, and I know exactly how many degrees of freedom I have. And so what does this look like now in software? What is an independent variable when we're talking about code? Well, all these examples are going to be in C Sharp, but uh, um, no matter what uh, language you use, uh, especially if it's an object-oriented language, uh, these are going to apply. Functional programming languages have an easy out. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, uh, in an object-oriented programming language, an independent variable looks like this. It's a member. It's a, uh, um, it's a, it's a member variable on your class. It's something that can change independently. In C Sharp, we also have auto properties. So we can express a property and say get set. Now it's, uh, it's backed by a, 
uh, a private member variable that we don't see. The compiler just kind of creates that for us. And so that is independent as well. It's something that we can change without affecting anything else. It's independent. And so <coughs> um, if those things are independent variables, what does a dependent variable look like? Well, um, well, yeah, before we get to a dependent variable, there's, uh, there's one thing that you might be thinking. It looks very similar to this, but it's, uh, it's different. This right here is not independent. Can anyone see why? Because you can't change it, exactly. It's got read only. So if I can't change it, it can't change independently. It's not an independent variable. So uh, I can initialize my class, give it a thing. Um, that thing is fixed. It's not going to be a different thing at any point in time. Uh, that thing might have independent variables within it, but I'm not introducing any new independent variables by doing this. And that's going to become really important as we get into designing our code. OK, so now these are all independent. What is um, dependent? What does a dependent variable look like in code? Um, well, one of the uh, things you could do is create a property that uh, um, you can see here that this property is backed by not a, uh, a private member variable of this class, but some property of some other class. So now when I get it, I can, um, you know, I, I can get the value from the other, uh, from the other object, so I get the thing. Uh, when I set it, I set the value back into it. So you can see here I'm introducing not just an unknown property, but I'm also introducing an equation. Property equals thing dot property. Now it looks like I'm introducing two equations here. I got the get and I got the set. But these are actually just inverses of one another. In order for get and set to make any sense, whatever I set, I should be able to get it uh, back later. Um, I should uh, have the equation run in one direction when I set it, another direction when I get it. They should be inverses. So they're really the same equation, just two different views of it. So uh, I haven't introduced any new degrees of freedom by creating properties like this. I've just created an, a dependent property. And we'll see, uh, uh, as we go through some code, some other examples of, uh, of dependence. So the code that we're going to go through uh, is, uh, is based on games. And uh, we're going to uh, start with a pretty simple game that uh, uh, a lot of you have probably done a, uh, a kata or koan of, around the bowling game. And uh, so the, the way that the bowling game kata usually works is, uh, is you do some test-driven development, and you start by writing a test. You know, when I roll all gutter balls, the score should be zero, and, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, so what I've done here is I've gone through that bowling game kata. And uh, I've come up with these tests. Uh, I should uh, be able to zoom in a little bit more on that. So I've got some tests. Like, uh, you know, these are just some, some helper methods that will allow me to roll one frame or uh, many frames. So if I roll many frames, 0, 0, and then the game score should be zero. Uh, so this is kind of testing out the very simplest thing in bowling where your score starts at zero. Uh, and in fact, if I run this test right now with the, uh, the code that I have, uh, that test will pass. Uh, if I roll one, one, then um, I've got 10 frames. I roll two frames, each knocking down one pin. The score should be 20. Um, and then. Here's where it starts getting kind of interesting. So I'm going to roll a single frame uh, with a 10, 0. That's a strike. I knocked down all the pins at uh, the beginning. And then I roll many frames of 1, 1. That, uh, um, that third parameter there is the starting index, so starting at frame 1, so starting after my strike. So now the strike means that. I score the next frame, uh, the next two rolls, in addition to uh, the next frame. So the, the first frame is actually worth 12. It's the original 10 for the strike, plus one uh, for each of the two one rolls following. And so then I've got 12 points followed by nine 
frames of two points, and I'll end up with a score of 30. And in fact, that's what I get. And so I keep on going through, and it looks like I've got uh, something that works. So let me go ahead and run all of these tests. And they all pass. Uh, now let's take a look at what the game class that I came up with looks like. And you can see that I've got here a, uh, an array of frames. So I'm going to initialize that with 10 frames at the, at the very beginning. And then I've got uh, a couple of extra rolls. So just in case I roll a strike on the, uh, on the last frame, I have two extra rolls that I can um, add to that strike. So, um, so that's all good. And now when I, um, let's, let's go ahead and dive into a frame. And you can see that a frame has the first roll and the second roll, and it's got a score. So uh, when I roll one of the frames, inside of my frame setter, I'm going to uh, increment the score. So I have just scored some points. Go ahead and store my first roll. And then um, I'll call score bonus for first roll on the game. So just in case we're on a spare or a strike, we'll go ahead and take that bonus. So let's go ahead and look at the number of degrees of freedom that we have in our original problem. How many degrees of freedom are in a bowling game? I heard a 12. So for, for each uh, frame, and we've got 10 frames, we've got two possible rolls. So uh, 2 times 10, 20. But then we have those extra um, rolls that we sometimes get. So um, maximum 22. And it really depends upon you if you get a, if you get a strike, it takes away one of your degrees of freedom. Uh, so it, it kind of varies, but you can say your, uh, um, your maximum number of degrees of freedom in a bowling game is 22. So now let's go back to the code and see how many degrees of freedom do we have in a frame in the code? Well, the game is read-only, the index is read-only, so those don't count. Now we've got our first roll and our second roll. Those can change. So it looks like we've got two frames, or two degrees of freedom per frame. Am I missing one? Do you see it right here? I've got an auto property. So the auto property can change. Uh, it's got a backing field to it. So even though the, uh, the code looks different, it's really just the same as first roll and second roll. So I've really ended up with three degrees of freedom, or three independent variables per frame. And uh, so that means that things might get out of sync. I might get into some trouble. And now sc uh, scroll down to where we're using that score, and you can see kind of where that trouble might kind of creep in, is that we're incrementing the score every time we make the roll, as opposed to computing the score from the rolls. So a little bit different way of, uh, of doing things. Um, but it doesn't seem like it's caused any problems, right? We've uh, passed all the tests. But what I didn't show you is down here, We've got a couple of other tests. Let me go ahead and uncomment those. So we've uh, built this, uh, this game. We've deployed it. It's running into, in, uh, uh, in production at the bowling alley. And uh, you know, people are really happy with it until one day uh, somebody rolls the ball. Uh, it uh, knocks down some pins, but the, the machine doesn't pick it up. And so they have to go in and edit. So, OK, well, we need to, yeah, we've got properties. We can set the properties at any point. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and roll a bunch of ones. But then I'll go back to, um, to frame number two, which would actually be the third frame. And I'll uh, change its first roll to, uh, to two. And so now the score should be 21. Because I, I had 20, and then they said, no, I really knocked down one extra pin there. 
if I run the test right now, that test is going to fail because I didn't get 21. For some reason, the code said I have, oh, right there, uh, I have uh, 22. So what was the problem? Can anyone see what the problem was? Exactly, I tallied it twice. All right, so um, I'm incrementing the score by the first roll every time, uh, rather than if I change the first roll from a 1 to a 2, I should only increment it by 1. So let me go ahead and fix that. I'll say, uh, first of all, score minus equal first roll. And then I can add the first roll and everything will be good. Let me go ahead and do the same thing here because I know I made the same mistake. All right, so that should pass all those tests. And indeed, that test passes. But now, uh, rather than editing the, uh, uh, the frame to be just a 1 to a 2, I'm going to edit that first frame and turn it into a spare. So what's going to happen here? I run the test, and again, the test fails. Uh, I should get 29, but what I actually got was 28. I'm missing some points. So where am I missing those points? Right, yes, the frame before. The, uh, uh, this frame should have gotten a bonus for having a single roll on the next, uh, uh, the next time through. But when I set that value the first time, there wasn't a, a uh, spare on the first frame. So I need to, uh, to go back and pick that up. And so you can see that uh, this is going to get um, pretty hairy because uh, you know, now score bonus for first roll, well, it's got to kind of figure out, well, did I score a bonus before or uh, is this a, my second time through? Things get, uh, get really complicated. So instead, what I'm going to do is just kind of jump forward to a different implementation altogether Rather than an algorithmic implementation of the bowling game, I'll use degrees of freedom. And now, this test will pass. And let me show you why. So now we're inside of a, uh, a different version of the frame class. So again, I've got my first role, I've got my second role. <coughs> but Frame is no longer an auto property in this case. Let's see what happened to frame, or to uh, score. So here now is my score. It doesn't even have a setter. It's just a getter. Um, you can just compute the score, and you do so by looking at the first roll and the second roll. So now we've turned score from an independent variable into a dependent variable. So every time I want the score, I'm going to go through this code, and it's going to compute it in the right way. So that's th uh, the advantage that we get from uh, identifying what are the number of degrees of freedom in the problem, and then make sure that we only have that many independent variables in the solution. And that will keep things in sync, and it will eliminate bugs, especially as we add new features like editing uh, frames in our game. But this isn't, this isn't like real world stuff. It's nobody's writing bowling game apps. But, hmm, I don't know. Maybe it is kind of like a, uh, uh, a real world application that you might write. Um, anybody work on, I don't know, General Ledger? Like an accounting system? Yeah, you might, uh, uh, you might need to uh, make some correcting uh, yeah, adjustments inside of your uh, accounting system, and if you were to compute your, your sum as you go, then go, going back and correcting the system might throw things off. But if you just compute what you need from the information that's already been provided uh, every time you need it, then, uh, um, then you'll always get the right answer. So, so maybe that does apply. But now, 
Uh, that reminds me of another game that, uh, that uh, we often model in code. Uh, and that's where we've got this domino effect of every time I change something, then I need to uh, recompute something else, and I need to recompute something else. Uh, and all of these changes sort of cascade. Uh, and so when we write code where we've got too many independent variables and we have to compute them as we go, then we'll end up with this cascading effect and uh, things just get out of hand really, really quickly. But the next game that I really want to study now is Dungeons and Dragons. So I'm going to ask you the same question I did before. Looking at the game, how many degrees of freedom? Go. One, six. GM, perfect. Yeah, yeah, class and uh, yeah, class and race and yeah, six was a, a really good answer that I hear a lot because um, uh, oftentimes you will uh, you will find six values for these um, you know strength, constitution, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, charisma, and from there compute a whole bunch of stuff. But class and race also uh, feature into that, as well as uh, any other um, you know, feats that you uh, choose, even your equipment, um, even sometimes your backstory uh, might give you some, uh, uh, some extra bonuses. So, uh, so there are different degrees of freedom that kind of uh, feature in. But we're just going to focus down on the, um, uh, the, the strength and the uh, dexterity right now uh, as we look at some code, because those are the two that determine, uh, most often, your attack. So if you're going to attack with a melee weapon, then you're going to basically be using strength. If you're going to attack with a ranged weapon, it's mostly dexterity. Um, so let's go ahead and look at some code and see how those might feature. So let's go to... There are my Dungeons and Dragons game tests. And again, I'll go ahead and run all the tests, and uh, they're all passing. Um, what these uh, tests are doing is it's uh, setting up a character, and the character has uh, armor class of, uh, oh, and, and the character is going to attack a creature. The creature has armor class of 14, it's an orc. Uh, the character is holding a, uh, a sword uh, with a bonus of 1, and uh, they have a strength of 12 and they're a level one character. Uh, and so take all these things uh, together, and if you roll an 11, you should miss, and if you roll a 12, you should hit. Uh, and that's because it's, it's taking um, your, your strength, and then the sword's bonus, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So let's go ahead and walk through the code. Let's see what the, uh, the character actually has. So we've got our strength and our dexterity. We've got our level. Uh, and then whenever we set the strength, we're going to compute our strength modifier. So, uh, so that just means if I'm at uh, 10, the modifier is 0. But I go up to a 12, I get a modifier of plus 1. Um, so you do that little bit of math, and you get your, uh, your strength modifier. And then same thing with dexterity. And uh, so now that's going to uh, help you compute your base melee attack, your base ranged attack. And uh, now we need to figure out what's our current attack based on what we're using. And so when we equip a weapon, and we've got our nice little eye weapon interface, uh, if the weapon is a melee weapon, then we're going to take our base melee attack and then use the weapon's attack bonus. If it's a ranged weapon, then we're going to use a base ranged attack and the weapon's uh, attack bonus there as well. And so finally, when we attack a creature, then we take our attack plus our roll. If it's equal to or greater than the armor class of the creature, then we've hit. So that's your basic Dungeons and Dragons. It's really a lot more fun to play than to talk about in code. <laughs> but you can see all the different degrees of freedom, all the different uh, um, uh, independent variables that we're going through here. We've got uh, these three. Uh, properties that are auto properties we can set. Uh, you know, the level is another auto property. Uh, how many degrees of freedom should we actually have here? You know, how many of these are truly independent? So the strength and the dexterity 
um, are, let's, uh, for the sake of uh, this argument, say independent, even though there are rules to how we level those up. So even those are dependent upon history, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, so right now they're independent. The level, uh, again, we'll keep that as independent. Uh, but then all these things that we're computing here, uh, the base melee attack, base ranged attack, the, uh, the current attack, these are all dependent. And we're computing them as we go. Uh, and so we already know that we're, that's going to cause uh, some troubles for us. But let's see what specific trouble that causes in this case. Because now we're going to equip an elven sword. So as you know, elves and orcs are ancient, ancient enemies. And so anything that an elf creates has an attack bonus against orcs. Um, they just do not get along. And so, um, so if I use an elven sword, then I should get an extra plus one against an orc. So if I attack an orc. So now, if I roll a 10, that should be my miss, but an 11 should be a hit. So let's see if that works. Well, we would expect this one to work. And indeed it does. But now the 11, that's where we run into some trouble because um, I can't tell that I'm using the elven sword at this point. If I take a look at my elven sword, I can see that it is a sword just like any other. But now it's got a racial attack bonus where if the race is orc, then it uses the attack bonus plus one. But now let me go back to where I am actually using or my uh, attack bonus. Back here when I attack, um, or actually right here when I uh, equip the weapon, that's when I'm taking the attack bonus from the weapon. So when I equip it, I don't know what kind of creature I'm going to hit with it. So I don't have that context. It's only when I get into context and I attack. That's when I know what uh, kind of creature I'm talking about. And so that's another reason that we need to uh, be really cognizant of our independent and our dependent variables, is that we might not have all the information in context to compute our dependent variables at the time that things are changing. So let me switch this from the pre-calculated to degrees of freedom. And now when I run all those tests, they don't pass. Why do they not pass? Oh, um, they don't pass because uh, I just set up the, uh, the scenario where now I can, uh, I can provide that context. So, so again, we're, we're down here uh, where we can attack. Um, but now you can see my current attack is computed. It's just a property with a getter. My uh, base melee attack and my base ranged attack are computed. So we fixed those problems. But uh, now we need to bring the uh, race into context. And so rather than just simply having the current attack as a property, what if we turn this into a method? So now I've got a method that allows me to get the current attack. And now I can provide that me method some context. So maybe uh, I need a current attack against a certain race. So now instead of the attack bonus, I'm going to call the, oh, the racial attack bonus for that race. So now I pass that through. And now I have all the context I need in order to pass the test. So even though I said at the beginning that properties with getters are dependent variables, they're not the only ones. Methods are dependent variables as well. Methods take all the context, not just the object that you're talking about, in order to compute what that dependent variable should be. 
And so here I want to, uh, to kind of take a step into functional land. How many uh, functional programmers have we got? A few, a few. And I see some, uh, some hand waggling. That's, uh, that's awesome. Play around with those functional languages because even if you're using an object-oriented language, uh, the things you learn from functional land uh, can really help you with your object-oriented code. That's, that's really where I learned uh, these concepts uh, for the first time. In a functional language, uh, the, uh, the variables that you declare are typically immutable. So it isn't that you have an object that has uh, fields in it that can change, but instead you call a function with some parameters and it's going to return a result. If you call that function again with those same parameters, it will return that same result every time. Uh, some, uh, some people call that referential transparency. I just simply like to call that determinism. It's going to do the same thing every single time. It's a deterministic function. Uh, and so you get some, uh, some benefits that you get out of, uh, that you can use there, like memoization. So um, let's go ahead and memoize uh, what the result of this function was given these uh, parameters. So now if I want to call that function again, just look it up. You know, with these parameters, I got that value before. I'll just re simply return that value again. And that can help with, uh, um, you know, with optimizing. It's, it's basically caching. Uh, if you cache things that don't change, your cache is never invalid. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. So, um, so yeah, here we are basically taking advantage of that behavior of functions, of deterministic functions, that if I call it with the same values, uh, it's going to return the same thing. Where we, where we run into a little bit of uh, uh, difficulty in object-oriented world is that the object that we call it on could be changing, so we can't really memoize uh, unless we prove that that object hasn't changed. Uh, so th those, are, those are some things you can get into to optimize your code so you're not calculating everything every time. But uh, uh, the, the concept is still uh, very applicable. The functions with their parameters give you the context so you can tell what uh, the value should be. And so. Now's the moment that you've all been waiting for. Settlers of Catan. Let's see if we got, okay, yeah, we've got plenty of time to go through settlers. So, um, little, uh, little sidebar, one of, my, uh, yeah, one of my best friends taught me how to play settlers uh, because he, he figured it was a shame that I yeah, was, called myself a gamer but still didn't know how to play this game. So it was like, no, come on, come over to the house. We're gonna play. Um, and so you kind of taught me the rules. And, and so for those of you, how many people do not yet know how to play settlers? Okay, great. So I'll, I'll go through the rules real quick. Um, so you've got these, uh, these five different resources here. Um, uh, wood, brick, wool, uh, ore, and wheat. And of course, uh, we don't call, uh, when we're playing the game, we don't call that wool, we call it sheep. And we don't call that, um, uh, well, I forget what other, yeah, little terms you use. But anyway, uh, so you've got those five resources, and it's primarily a trading game. Um, if, uh, if you, you're going to you need to use these resources in order to build things. So if you want to build roads, you need one brick, one wood. Uh, and so uh, you're going to uh, position your, your pieces, your cities, uh, on the board so that uh, randomly those positions will produce resources and you'll be able to use them. But you will never be able to uh, just uh, win the game based on the resources that you collect from the board, you have to trade. And so uh, it's really a trading game. You have to figure out what's this other person got, what's he trying to do, is it, is it in my best interest to do this trade or is it really in their best interest? Uh, and so you, uh, um, you really have to kind of figure out what people are, are thinking. So that's what makes it a brilliant game. Uh, but now, after we, uh, after we played our first game, I went back and, of course, I, I did a strategy search, figured out, hey, what's the best way to play Settlers of Catan? And uh, I found somebody that, uh, uh, that, showed, that kind of pointed out, um, in order to score any points in the game, you have to create settlements, cities, or draw development cards. Now, settlement, city, and development card all require wheat. So, if you can position your cities so that you monopolize the wheat and then you refuse to trade it with anybody else, it'll be a really long game and your friends will hate you, <laughs> but you will probably win. 
So, um, so I, I tried that, and of course he knew about that strategy, and so he prevented me from doing that, but it was a, a lot of fun. Yes? Uh, no, it doesn't apply to all the different scenarios. So um, uh, you can get expansion packs for, uh, for settlers, which basically have, uh, you know, they've kind of seen that strategy. Eh, that's just not a good strategy, and they kind of fix that. So, um, so yeah, most of the time nowadays, if you play settlers, you're playing with some kind of expansion pack. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the, the, the point is that now what if I want to play settlers with somebody uh, remotely? You know, maybe we've got uh, mobile apps. And so I want to, um, you know, to take my move and exchange it with them. Uh, they'll uh, exchange their moves with me. And then I should be able to see through that history of moves what uh, actually happened. Um, and so now if we get into this situation where we're, we're trying to synchronize two things in a, in a mobile application, it's really hard to synchronize things that can change. Because uh, like, like how many people have, uh, have used uh, Outlook during the, uh, um, the active sync days. So yeah, we've got a few uh, old timers. So um, uh, what used to happen all the time, it basically you would use Outlook on your big old Windows mobile phone with the stylus. And uh, um, you know, you would tap something to delete it. And then you would dock it to your, uh, to your PC. You had this big old you know, thing that plugged into a serial port in the back. That was before they had USB you dock it to your PC, and then it would sync up with Outlook on the PC, but hey, I just deleted a contact here, and I just changed his email address there. I can't tell what you did. I'm just going to duplicate that. Now you've got two of them with both email addresses on both devices. So, what? No. No. It's, it's really hard to sync things that can change. Um, and so we've gotten a lot better at that, and the way that we've, uh, we've done that, we've, we've started to adopt patterns where rather than syncing the things that change, we're syncing the immutable objects that led up to those, um, those states. And so that's why we want to build Settlers of Catan. Um, so let's take a look at the code that we've got for Settlers right now. There we go. And uh, so right now I've got a game uh, having four players. And the game, uh, uh, so each player has a hand. And the hand has resources. So let's kind of drill down through those things. And so right now I'm just simply um, saying that the, the resources in their hand are uh, these these five objects, you know, these, uh, these five properties, wood, brick, wool, ore, and wheat. And so you can see that uh, um, I've got my hand. Uh, and so I've got this auto property that says, what are the resources that are in my hand? And so when I um, want to trade with somebody, I'm going to require that we each have what we're actually trying to trade. I'll subtract from one, add to another. So. Uh, by the way, who's, uh, who's ever you know, had a, a, you know, gone to a, a talk about um, you know, like, uh, transactions, you know, distributed transactions? So you, st you begin your transaction, uh, you want to transfer between two um, accounts at your, at your bank, so the bank begins a transaction, they decrement the, uh, the balance from one, increment the balance for the, in the other, and then commit. That is a bad example. That's not the way that banks actually do that. Um, but that's, that's what we're doing here, is that we are, um, we are subtracting a balance from one hand and we're adding it to another hand. Um, and the, uh, the reason that that's a, a bad idea is that um, over time you're going to collect all this history. Uh, if you were to just look at your account balance at any given point in time, uh, it wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't, it wouldn't express what that history was. And it would be really hard to synchronize that, to take your account statement from here and your account statement from your balance and say, well, what, what happened? What's in here? What's not in here? Versus just looking at histories. Oh, yeah, these line up. I don't have this one. Let me take that in. You don't have that one. You take that. And then things line up a lot easier. Um, so uh, subtract, add. Let's go ahead and look at what these are doing. So we're just changing the uh, amount of wood, brick, wool, ore, and wheat based on those trades. 
So let's run the test that we've got so far. And if I run all the tests, then right now they're all passing. So, um, you know, my hand is initially empty. Okay, let's get player zero from the game, and I've got no resources. Uh, let's go ahead and trade. So, um, so player one is going to draw two brick, uh, two wood, one brick. Player two is going to draw wool and wheat, and then we're going to perform a trade. And then that's the uh, the state of their hands after that trade. Um, you can't trade what you don't have. So if we try to perform a trade and we don't have those resources, then it should throw an exception. You know, the player does not have enough wood or ore or wheat. So all those things are working so far. But let's see what is not going to work for us. So here, I want to be able to see a history of all the moves, because now I want to exchange those moves with another mobile device, and I want to keep those things in sync. And so um, I'm going to draw, I'm going to trade, and then I want to get all the moves in the game. Now I should have three moves, I should have two draws and a trade in that order, and uh, Right now, I don't even have the moves property, um, so I can't. I, this feature was just never even thought of. Uh, and so, what we want to do is restructure this code so that instead of looking at the current state of the system and changing that every time you make a move, just capture the move. So, I'm going to switch from the mutable version to the degrees of freedom version. And now, things are looking a lot better. Um, now, I still can't compile because I don't have, uh, I don't yet have that array of moves, but uh, I can see now that I've got a move class, and a move could be a draw, or a move could be a trade. So. Uh, this player is going to draw these resources, or this player is going to trade these resources with that player for those resources. So those are just different moves that I'm capturing. And then, so let me, uh, let me go ahead and capture those moves. Right now, if I take a look at the game, here's my new game class. I've got... Uh, a, uh, a list of draws and a list of trades. And so as I am making a draw, all I'm doing is I am adding that draw to the collection. I'm just saying, OK, there was a draw. This player drew these resources. That's it. I'm not changing any state on the player. OK, when they do a trade, well, I'm going to say I require that player A has those resources, and player B has those resources. So that's where I'm going to throw my exceptions. That's where I validate my trade. But then I just add it to the collection, and I don't update the objects that I'm talking about. I'm just keeping track of what happened. I'm just keeping track of history. But then I can say, well, show me all the draws for a player, and then sum up all their resources. So that's all the draws for that player. Uh, I can show. Here are all the trades to a player. So either they were player A, and it's resources B that were coming to them, or they're player B, and resources A were coming to them. Either way, I take those collections, union them together, add them up. Trades from is just the opposite direction. And that allows me to figure out the current state of a player. So now a player simply has a game, and we can see how many draws for this player, plus trades to this player, minus trades from this player. That is my current set of resources. That's my current hand. I'm computing my current state from the history. And now that allows me to do very nice things like this. Um, we're here in the, uh, in the 
game, not that version of the game, but this version of the game. Rather than having a list of draws and a list of trades, let's just have a list of moves. So now this is the entire history of everything that's happened. So now instead of just adding to draws, I add to the moves. Instead of adding to trades, I add to the moves. And then the draws for a player, well, that's going to be from the list of moves. I want to, uh, uh, of type draw. So those are going to be just my draws. Uh, here, trades is moves of type trade. So now I've got all of my uh, all of my code ready for the one final step where I take moves and I turn that into a property. So now I can expose all of the uh, moves, but now of course I don't want to expose them as lists. Why is that? Yeah, because the list can be modified. I've got a degree of freedom. I've got an independent variable. Doesn't mean that I want anybody else to ex exercise that degree of freedom. It's mine. So I enumerable. And now everything builds and everything passes. So going back through this code, we can see here my players read only. I can't add new players to the game. The list of moves, that is an independent variable. That history is independent. Go into a move, and uh, I've cheated here. Um, so let me dive down uh, again into draw. Because I'm lazy, I went ahead and used, uh, um, I used auto properties here. But uh, what I could also have done is uh, created player and resources as constructor parameters, initialized it, set those as read-only properties or read-only fields, and then these properties would only have getters. Um, if you look at the code, you'll see that nobody's actually exercising the setter except for the, uh, the, uh, the places where I'm creating these objects. Uh, if it were easier to express this, then um, that there wouldn't be any friction, and I would just go ahead and do that. And it's getting easier. Uh, C Sharp 6 makes this a little bit easier. Uh, they took out uh, one feature that would have made it a lot easier. But F Sharp, F -sharp does, uh, uh, does read-only fields and uh, uh, getter-only properties by default. So um, maybe you can just express all your types in F -sharp. That would be cool, too. Um, so what we end up with is a system in which we only have one degree of freedom, and that's the history. That's everything that happened in the past. That's my one independent variable. And I compute everything else from that. And so that makes it really easy to sync things up, makes it really easy to see what the current state of the system is. Um, and uh, and it's, uh, it, it's become quickly a, uh, a favorite pattern for doing um, distributed systems. Uh, anybody recognize the, uh, uh, the pattern that we're talking about? Event sourcing, perfect, that is it. So we've just got this series of events that have occurred. We play them against uh, you know, some kind of objects or we just simply query them like we're doing here, sum them up and get our answer. So, so yeah, Settlers of Catan, just a game. Nobody would actually do that, but you know what? The event sourcing is applicable to building modern uh, uh, distributed systems. So maybe we would. So uh, to kind of sum it all up, the, uh, the reasons that we're going to be using degrees of freedom in order to uh, evaluate our code is that, uh, first of all, uh, it'll help us to add features uh, without breaking existing uh, code, like when we would need to edit the, uh, the frames in a, uh, in a bowling game. I can do that without breaking the, uh, the scoring system. Uh, it'll avoid the domino effect. So when I change something, I won't have to 
uh, update something else and store that value, and then compute something else and store that value. Uh, it allows us to understand the context at the time that we need to compute our dependent variables, because we can pass those as parameters to functions. We don't have to pre-compute them. And uh, it allows us to preserve history, and then use that history in order to figure out the current state. And now we can synchronize that history with our collaborators much more easily than we can synchronize things that change. So degrees of freedom, it's the uh, number of unknowns minus the number of equations, or it's simply the number of independent variables. Analyze your system, find the number of degrees of freedom, and then when you write your code, make sure that your code only has that many private fields, only that many independent variables. And thank you very much. Do we have any uh, any last questions? Yeah. So if, if calculating like the, the state from the history was less less than trivial, mm -hmm. a lot of time, like how would you do, how would you add like the concept of like a check point or to do that now? Or I, I already computed this at this point in time. I'm going to save that, mm -hmm. and then I can just go from that. Right. So uh, if uh, computing the current state was less than trivial, how would you? Uh, how would you checkpoint? Um, if you look at your domain, there probably already are natural checkpoint mechanisms that you can put in there. Uh, like, for example, in, in any general ledger, um, if, you're, if you're doing a, a business uh, accounting system, you are probably going to want to close the books at the end of the day. Well, when you do that, you capture the current balance of all your accounts at the end of that day, and now you're only looking at that uh, last snapshot plus uh, all of the transactions referencing that account that occurred during that day. Um, but even if your domain doesn't have a natural checkpoint uh, place within it, then, um, then it's, uh, it's, it's usually time. Uh, it's usually some uh, component that you can put in place. There's a, uh, uh, there's a really great pattern that I like to, uh, to use. I like to call it the train switch pattern, where uh, if you've got just a continuous stream of events that are going into your system, and there's no time when you close the books, you let things quiesce, and uh, you know, nobody's going to be transacting any business during these times. You know, that doesn't occur. This is an online, uh, you know, worldwide business. You're going to have transactions all the time. Uh, in those cases, uh, you can think of it as you've got these, uh, these trains coming down the track, and you've just got the switch. And at some point, you're just going to throw the switch, and the train, instead of going down this track, is going to go down that one. Uh, and so you just... Uh, you just put that switch just before you start to collect the, the events. And so, um, so now you can uh, start to collect the events, um, throw the switch at any uh, given point, and then um, it might take a little bit of time for the events that are still coming down that track to, uh, to get in there. Uh, and you, you store those all up. And then uh, at that point, you'll say, OK, that part has quiesced. The system is still going. But now I can compute my snapshot from here. And uh, now I've got my snapshot set up. Um, so uh, you did that same thing yesterday. And so what you were doing is from that snapshot yesterday, you were taking all of your events, the ones that are on this track, and now the ones that are going down that track. And so this snapshot plus these events plus these events is current state. It might take some time for you to catch up on that second track. But when you do, you can now say, these events plus whatever's on the third track is my current state. And those will agree. Um, and so that's, that's a mechanism that uh, you can put in place uh, without pausing the system and letting everything add up. Yes? What about the, there's an invalid trade in the cells of Japan? Mm -hmm. That's always a question I've been thinking it's supposed to be like a physical system. If you order something that's just not there. Yes. Uh, so what if you had an invalid trade? So we've got um, player. So when you, uh, that's the wrong version of player. Uh, this is the right version of player. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, that's now inside of the game. Uh, when I do a trade, before I actually capture that as a move, I still want to validate it. So given current state, I still want to, uh, to see, was this a valid trade? Now, in a two-player game or a multiplayer game like this, where you're taking turns and you're going around, you can, you can tell when it's your turn, that uh, all the other turns have, have come in and they are accounted for. But when you're talking about, say, a, uh, a banking system, 
you've got different ATMs, uh, and they might be offline for any number of, uh, of hours, um, still dispensing cash and processing those uh, transactions. At that point, you can't be absolutely certain that you have the information to put these checks in place. But that's, again, where you go back to your domain, and maybe that's a revenue opportunity. That's a place where now you can charge your customer a fee because they should have known that they didn't have enough money to withdraw, but yet they did. Um, so, so yeah, that just, that's a conversation you need to have with your, um, uh, with your product owner. They need to understand that these things happen in software. And they probably already understand that these things happen in the real world because you know, in the real world, you talk to somebody, uh, you get agreement, you go off and talk to somebody else, something that might have changed, uh, and, and you, uh, you need to be able to account for that. Uh, and so that's where you'll have your, um, your uh, correcting transactions that come, come by later after you've discovered that something has happened. But now that you have this entire history and you can see what's happened, you can make those corrections more easily as well. Good questions. All right, anything else? All right, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs>